Good afternoon and welcome to the Jerusalem Fund and the Palestine Center. I'm Zena Azam. I'm the executive director here and I'm really delighted to have you all with us today. And a uh, special welcome to people who are online in the United States and in Palestine. Today we have a special event featuring a school that has touched the lives of so many people. It's located in the city of Ramallah in the West Bank and has played a big role in so many people's experiences growing up in Palestine and beyond. This is the Ramallah Friends School, of course. I know many of you, I think some of you have uh, actually, you're graduates of the school, you, or you know people who have, who have attended the school, you've worked for the school, you've supported it, or you're involved in Quaker education. And this is really wonderful to have you all with us today. The school was founded on the Quaker principles of pacifism and nonviolence and respect for all people, as well as of a, a commitment to simplicity, equality, and service. To tell the story of this school, two energetic individuals who are with us today, Betsy Brinson and Gordon Davies, they set out to collect oral histories from people living in Ramallah and in Albire. These cover the last 70 years. Most of them are the recollections of Palestinians who were students at the French school or worked there or who have relatives who did one or the other. The book contains the history of how the girls' and boys' schools originated, the school's life and curriculum and physical surroundings, and how the administration, teachers, and students survived and dealt with war, starting with the Ottoman Empire and World War I and all the way up to the current Israeli occupation. The book is titled Sumud. To explain the, si the title, there's a quote on page, 20 uh, page 86 of the book by the noted Palestinian Quaker and author Jean Zaru. Here's a quote from her. The word Sumud in Arabic might best be translated as steadfastness. It plays an incredibly important part in Palestinian culture and self-identity. To practice Sumud, means to remain steadfast on one's land, and more generally, to remain steadfast in service to one's homeland and to the struggle for freedom. Just waking up every morning with a determination to carry on with one's daily routine and to hold fast to one's humanity in spite of the challenges and dangers is to practice sumud. In this case, the steadfastness of the Ramallah Friends School through social, political, and economic challenges it has faced throughout its history. This is what we're talking about in terms of Samud. We're also honored to have Joyce Ajluni joining us today. She has held the position of director of the Ramallah Friends School since 2004. She's the first on my right. Uh, Joyce is also a graduate of the school and has a background in international development. Previously, she worked for the United Nations as well as international humanitarian and development agencies. Joyce and the two authors of the book will talk about this oral history that they've collected about the school. And let me introduce the two authors. Betsy Brinson is a public historian, educator, and social justice activist. She has published articles, contributed oral history interviews to books, museum exhibits, and archives and created three award-winning film documentaries. She taught history and women's studies at several US universities. Gordon Davies has worked in higher education administration during much of his career. He has taught higher education, religious studies, and literature at several universities, including Birzeit University on the West Bank. At the end, you'll have the opportunity to purchase the book. We'll have it in the back. And please note that the sales of all the books will entirely go to support financial aid at the Ramallah Friends School. So I'll s ask our speakers to talk for about 40 minutes, after which we'll open the floor for questions and discussion. Welcome. Thank you, Zena. And welcome, everybody, and uh, also those uh, watching on the live stream. Um, I wanted to just, um, point of order, just to say, I will be talking a little bit about uh, the school, just giving you some background, putting things in context, and then uh, Betsy and Gordon will speak more about their experience in authoring the book, and, um, and I will leave that to them. So I'm gonna speak for 
hopefully no more than 10 to 15 minutes and then and leave that the rest to, to Betsy and Gordon and then at the end we hope we can have about 20 minutes for some questions and answers with you okay so um, so what's in a school and why why do we need to tell the story of the Ramallah Friends School the Ramallah Friends School as you all know is a fixture in Palestinian society as people if I, if I ask people in the street in Ramallah uh, what do you know about the Friends School they're going to give me some answers. I'm going to sort of guess what they're going to they're going to say. The first thing they will say that it's the, the best school in Palestine. So I didn't say that. I'm just guessing what they said. <laughs> they also say that it's been there forever and ever. They will say that it builds leadership and qual and and characters for the graduates. They will say that a bunch of Quakers run it and they don't know who the Quakers are <laughs> but um, so that's something that we need to work more on is to is to um, have the, have people understand who the Quakers are and I think our graduates know but the community at large could use more information they will probably also say that the best looking boys and girls go to our school <laughs> anyhow this is their list but I have my own list as well I, I believe, and through my 11 years of experience as uh, in a leadership position at the school, and before that, as Zena said, I, I'm a graduate of the school. I was there from first grade, and my mother graduated from there, and my grandmother graduated from there, and my father went there but left to the States before he graduated, and my husband and my kids. And, and so this is a, a family that has a huge history with the school. And so I come across a lot of graduates and a lot of people who have come through our, our, our halls and, and, and attended this school. What is really astonishing to me, and, it, and I never cease, it never ceases to amaze me, is the, the amount of gratitude the graduates have for their school. It is just amazing that I, w I don't want to say all of them, but the overwhelming majority of them tell me that the school changed their lives. That the if it weren't for the school, they will not be who they are as people, let alone where they are in their careers or in their lives. And so what school has that, that, that power to impact the lives of people so profoundly? I see a lot of you know, uh, nodding in the audience. And I, I know we have a very, our youngest graduate is here. Kusai, you graduated in uh, 2011. And, um, and I know that all of them, young and old, say the same thing about their experience at the school. So these testimonials are quite powerful. And so I wonder, what is it that we did throughout the 146 years of our history that impacts the lives of people like, like so. So the schools were established in 1869, and as Zena said, it, they went through Ottoman rule, uh, then British mandate, and then Jordanian administration, and then Israeli occupation, and, uh, and then the uh, intifadas and the wars and, the, and, and all of that, and then the Palestinian Authority took over education, the schools you know, started off as boarding schools. Of course, they were no, no longer boarding schools because borders were shut. And so people from uh, the Middle East and the Levant area could no longer come to the school. So they stopped being boarding schools. But after all of that turmoil, after all of that, these, these incredible stories in the book that you will read of um, bombardment of, uh, of uh, our, our classrooms being hit, of the schools being used as refugee, uh, a, a place for refugees to stay. Um, and so uh, all of these stories is just incredible that with all of that, the school still, still stands today and, and very strong. In my opinion, if I wanted to say one reason why it has survived, other than that commu the community's appreciation and love for the school, I attribute it to the Quaker tradition and Quaker values of the school. 
I was uh, in an interview with some of the interns this morning from the Dusum Fund, and they asked this question about, you know, what is it about the values of the school? And, and this is our challenge there. You know, we, we are like other Quaker schools um, in this country. I'm happy to see um, Mamadou, uh, guy here, who's the principal of the Sidwell Friends School, Upper School. Uh, we share a lot in common. Um, we share, you know, a commitment to our Quaker values. When we talk about these values, we are, we are talking about nonviolence, equality, tolerance, service. And I can't see anywhere else in the world where these values are more pertinent than in Ramallah, where our community is subjected to violence on a daily basis and is challenged to think about equality and is challenged to think about um, the, uh, the, these Quaker values I in a very difficult way. I have some students who come and tell me, how could we be thinking of nonviolence when we are subjected to violence? And so this is, this is where th our school comes in and, and challenges the students to, to think about the nonviolent ways of resisting the occupation. Um, so the, 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 the Quaker Foundation the va and these values kept us af afloat. And, and I know that uh, if it weren't for these values, this school would not have been, uh, would not have survived, would not have um, survived and, and ma uh, samdat, meaning it would not have been so, st so steadfast. Uh, I had another question this, this morning as well from one of the interns about the word samud. And I want to add one thing. I think also the school contributed a lot to the steadfastness of the Palestinian people in Palestine. Because a lot of parents have come to me and said, you know, we lost so much with occupation and with our, our lives. We lost our freedom, we lost our homes, we lost so much. But we are not gonna lose our investment in our on, in our children's education. And I think this is the main thing that the school uh, had really ascertained, is that it allowed the, the families who believed in good education, uh, we are the only international baccalaureate IB school in Palestine who really believed in good education, it allowed these families to stay. And a lot of them come to me and say to me, you know what, Joyce, we would have left a long time ago if it weren't for the Ramallah Friends School, because you're offering us something. So basically, the school had has a role in the steadfastness of the people in keeping them there, which is exactly what the Israeli occupation does not want, as we all know. So I don't want to take too long. I can speak endlessly about why this is the, a fantastic place, but I do want to sort of put you all in the picture of right now uh, what the school uh, looks like today, because a lot of you may have known it from its earlier years. I just wanted to make sure that you know uh, what, where the school stands today. So the school is owned by Friends United Meeting. Um, this is a Quaker um, group in Richmond, Indiana, and they run the school to hire the board of trustees. There's a local board of trustees that runs the school. We have about uh, 1,360 students we are no longer, um, uh, we no longer segregate the sexes. Uh, since 1990, the schools merged. Sometimes we use the words boys school, girls school, because this is the historic name, but the schools are very much co-educational. We have two campuses. One is the kindergarten elementary campus, and the other one is the middle school, upper school campus, very much like Sidwell, I think. And so in that respect, um, that's how it looks like. Uh, so we don't have boarding anymore. And as I said, we are the only international baccalaureate school. We offer the diploma program and the middle, s middle years program. And we are uh, presently working on getting authorization from the International Baccalaureate Organization for the PYP, which is a primary years program. So in two years, um, our school will be kindergarten through 12th grade, fully an IB school. Um, uh, we are also something that's very dear to my heart. We are also the only inclusive educational school in Palestine. Um, unlike schools in the, in, in the United States where the public school system takes uh, over servicing children with special needs, in Palestine that does not happen. Um, and so 
the school took it upon itself about 20 years ago to start a, a learning support uh, program, and it is really the only choice for Palestinian kids who have some special needs to be incorporated and included in, in the school system. At present, we serve about 60 students. Uh, some of them have Down syndrome, Williams syndrome, autistic kids, et cetera. They are completely in integrated in our school community. And that speaks volumes about our Quaker mission for equality and that this school is really open for all and it's not really just for the bright or just for the rich. Uh, we have about 15 percent of our students are on financial aid. So it tells you that this is a very inclusive place where, it, where we have students who come in from refugee camps, villages, and the grandson of the president, you know, so everybody's there. And so this is uh, something that we pride ourselves with. We mo we're trying to move away from also um, charging a lot of fees for our students, but even with the meager, in my opinion, uh, meager for us, but for a lot of families, it's a lot of money, uh, 3500 and that's hundred dollars a year that's our tuition average um, for the school so that, that for an IB school that sends kids every year to Harvard and Yale and Stanford I, that's an awesome deal I think and so that's uh, that's something that really we are very proud of because we know we can double and triple tuition uh, and we will still have you know a number of students who can afford it but then that stops uh, delivering our main message of inclusiveness and and this is where we really hold it um, we hold ourselves responsible for that so um, the the school uh, offers also a lot of psychosocial um, uh, help to our students uh, we are very much in tune uh, last last year with uh, after the onslaught uh, on Gaza uh, the students came back, the lower school students feeling a lot of anger and agitation. The lower school principal came to me saying, there's a lot of physical violence on campus. The, he's noticing things that he didn't notice before. And so we had to hire another so psychosocial um, staff member. And so this is, this is, the, um, this is the, the type of support and role that we see um, the school taking. Um, I want to go back to Samud and, um, and, and uh, to Betsy and Gordon, but I, I want to take this opportunity to thank both of them for their courageous and, uh, and, and wonderful effort that they came and lived amongst us for a year to, and, and this book was not in the making, you know, wasn't even thought about, and I let them tell you about how that idea came about, but really I wish to thank them. I also want to thank New England Yearly Meeting for their financial support for the book, as well as PARC, the Palestinian American Research Center, who also uh, provided us with some grant money to allow us to publish this book. Uh, I also want to say that when, when you read page 48, you will read a little anecdote that I uh, I, uh, I thought that was a funny one on my part because I didn't even remember saying it. I was going through the book last night. I'm like, ah, oh, I can't believe I said that, but I will end with that. Um, I was talking about a sports um, activity of mine and uh, when I was a student there playing basketball and how I struggled to get the shot in. And finally, when I got the shot in, I was like, yes, I got it in. And to my surprise, it was the other team's goal that I had. <laughs> and so, and, and so this is just one delightful anecdote story that is in this book. Uh, this book made me cry and it made me laugh. Uh, it was uh, a wonderful, wonderful effort on uh, the part of Betsy and Gordon. Uh, they did a brilliant job to put it together to keep those stories alive. Uh, this story of the Ramallah Friends School needs to be heard and um, we are proud of it. We are so grateful for so many friends in this room and uh, abroad and ev all over the world that um, believe in our mission and, and continue to support us. And so uh, I want to thank you all for coming and I leave the floor to my colleagues. Thank you. Okay, signal if you can't hear me because I know I'm soft-spoken. Um, 
and I think I have just shelved all the notes I plan to share with you, but um, one of the things that I was asked to do was just sort of give you some sense of how this project came about. Uh, Gordon and I are both members of the Richmond uh, Friends Meeting, and uh, so we subscribe to Friends Journal, and I know there are friends in the room. And if you're like me, you read the articles, but you read the classified ads in Friends Journal. And this must have been 2001, I was reading the ads, and there was this ad for two teachers at the George School in Pennsylvania who were organizing a listening pilgrimage to Israel and Palestine as a way of helping to understand what the issues really were from both sides uh, of the conflict. And I thought, oh, that's exactly what I need. I've never been there. I keep trying to read things. I don't really know people well who have experience there. And so I signed up. And there were eight teachers. Uh, we went one summer, 2002 summer. And we did exactly that. We, we stayed with people in Israel. We stayed with people in Palestine. We met with uh, staff and whatnot of various NGOs and Jewish peace groups. Uh, we actually stood in vigils, the women in black vigil in, in um, Israel. We also stood in vigils in Ramallah. So we got a good experience there. And one of the stops we made was the Ramallah Friends School. And the it was about this time of year, and the students were actually out of school for the summer, but they were coming back to pick up their report cards and whatnot. So I could see what these young people looked like a little bit. And some of the administration uh, had offered to give us a talk about the school and tell us pretty much what Joyce just told us. And as a historian, um, I thought, this is all very interesting, but I said to, it was Mahmoud, head of the boys' school at that point, and I said, I'd, as a historian, I'd love to read your history. And he said, but we've never written one. And so or over the course of the next six months in email conversations with Joyce, who was actually traveling on behalf of the school, but I did not meet her uh, on that first trip to Ramallah, we said, let's see what we could find about the history. And, you know, we, we all say, no, we really didn't know early on that we were going to write a book, but I think I knew we were going to write a book out of all this. And so I started out with the research by going to the various Quaker colleges, Earlham, Guilford, Wilmington College, um, Haverford, and looking to see what they had in their collection. And, of course, a lot of the early American Quakers um, came back, and they, in, in a day and age where we all wrote letters and not email, we had their correspondence. And as they aged, they knew they needed to find a place uh, to home all of that. So those personal letters went into um, various collections along with old photographs. And the photographs were of the school but they were also of their holiday visits when they left campus and they went to see the pyramids in Egypt, you know. So we saw a lot of camels and pyramids and whatnot, but we saw a lot of beautiful old photos, some of which uh, I saw up here on the screen today and we've included in the book. So that was our first source of materials for primary documents. And then when we arrived there, <coughs> we really, both of us really felt, you know, we have some materials written from the American Quaker perspective, but we really want to hear the Palestinian voice in all of this. So as an oral historian, I thought, well, the way to do this is oral histories. And we were a little bit limited in that we couldn't travel around the world where a lot of the graduates of the school lived. We were in Ramallah, and so we used graduates and former teachers and administrators largely who still live in Ramallah today. As it happened, the Friends Meeting there was having a 100th anniversary celebration of their meeting house, so it brought back a number of people for that event that we were also able to, to interview. So it's those 52 people who really gave us their stories um, 
that kind of make up the voices that you're going to hear. The New England Yearly Meeting and Park uh, were generous and gave us a little bit of money to transcript the oral history interviews. Uh, I'm happy to say that all of those materials are now permanently archived in Earlham College's Quaker collection for future research. And of course, we did a lot of editing along the way, so what you see in the book are just the tip of the iceberg of the stories that we actually did uncover in those interviews. Uh, you heard about how the book is sort of structured thematically around themes like curriculum, uh, the role of religion, uh, buildings and grounds, war and occupation, school life and whatnot, and what Ramala Friends taught me as a student. Uh, but it's the stories that really will really tell you the most about that. Very quickly, we, you've heard bits and pieces here uh, already about some of the history that influenced the school, but think back if you can. Think about what it would have been like in 1869. And think about that here, and think about it in terms of Quakers because it was Eli and Sybil Jones from the New England Yearly Meeting in 1869 who really should be credited with being the founders of the school. Sybil had been down in Washington during the Civil War. She'd actually volunteered her services in a number of the Civil War hospitals. Um, she actually was a friend of Mary Lincoln, so that she dealt with the Lincoln's death and, and his wife and family and whatnot. And all of that was kind of over. And so she went back home and she had six children of her own and a husband who was a farmer but was also involved in a Quaker school. And they made a trip to Jerusalem. And I'm not really quite sure what it was specifically that took them to Jerusalem, but it was something about being Quaker. And they gave presentations and whatnot. And then one night, a young woman in the audience came up to them whose name was Miriam, Miriam Karim. 15 years old, and she said, would you come and start a girls' school here in Palestine because we don't have one? And they said to her, well, who would teach? And she said, I will. Well, as it turned out, her father actually had seen that she had some education. And it's not clear again from the early records whether they went on and educated her for another year, but or whether she really had enough education at that point. It's sort of mixed uh, mystery for us to figure that out. In any event, she was the first teacher of the girls' school. And the girls' school started out, the first one in Ramallah, but they were traveling schools. And so in time, they built up, and they were American Quaker women, largely, a few men, came over and they would stay for a year or two years, in some cases even longer, and they would travel to as many as of the seven villages in the surrounding Ramallah area, and they would hold school. And they, how do you think they'd travel in those years? Donkeys, Donkeys. right, right. So it was a far cry um, from what you might expect, but that's really the origin of girls' schools in Palestine, and in 1889, there was enough interest that they opened up a residential girls' school in uh, Ramallah, and the attraction there came beyond just the, um, the immediate area, and over the years, families would send their daughters in from other countries in the region because of the, uh, for one, because the school taught English. And that was very attractive to families that their children would grow up being bilingual. But it was also the Quaker values and the ethics that were shared, I think, that made it an attractive institution. So you raise a whole generation of women. They marry, they have families, including boys and girls. So about 1901, some of these women graduates said, you know what, we'd really like this kind of education for our sons. So out of all that came the establishment of the Friends Boys School, 10 blocks away on a separate campus from the girls, keep them separate except when you send them to meeting on Sunday morning. 
and you'll hear some stories about what that's like. Um, but that's basically kind of real quick background to how the school came about. Um, so I think the most important thing to do here is stop and let Gordon read you some of the stories, and then we'll have some Q&A and talk more from there. I will say it was such a privilege to do this project, and one of the interns asked me this morning about was it a hard project to do in terms of the research? And, and I said, well, it, it was hard because I'm a late 19th, early 20th century American social justice historian. I didn't know Palestinian history. So we had to learn all of that and figure it out in these different segments. And then we all, the other big concern there was, for me especially, was whether I was going to get my oral history interview tapes in and out of the Tel Aviv airport and Israeli security. And I got a lot of questions about why I was carrying tape recorders in and out. And we, we worried about it and sort of deal with it in advance. We sent it out in three different sections with three different people and three different suitcases at three different times so that if they were confiscated, <coughs> we weren't going to lose them all. And it turned out it, we didn't have the concern that we did have. We, all of that survived. And my last trip out with my tape recorder, the young woman who checked us through security, she didn't even bother. To, she must have been 25. She didn't even bother to ask me all the things they usually ask you about. What are you doing with the tape recorder? She just looked at it, and she said, oh, an antique. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. <laughs> Well, the first announcement I have to make uh, this afternoon is that I will not read the story Joyce told you on page 48. <laughs> I was going to, but I took it off the list, Joyce. <laughs> no sense being repetitive. What I'll do is, is read a few stories, uh, and I was supposed to read from the text, and we decided that the most interesting thing would be to just read some of the anecdotes and observations made by people in their oral histories. Uh, so I won't read text. I'll just read uh, excerpts from the, uh, from the histories, and these are in the book. Uh, for instance, a, a young man in his class of 1958 wrote that they, they, the school, gave us something called ethics. It is how to live a good life. It's how to be nice to people, how not to steal, not to say bad words. This is what religions are about. Muslim religion, Christian religion, Jewish religion. They all stand for the same things. The problem is the people. They misuse religion. Well, we're off to a good start. We have a boarding school here in the, by the time it's in the 20s and 30s up through 1967 when it becomes impossible to have a boarding school because the borders are closed and you can't be a boarder if you can't cross the border. Uh, but things were simple. He said breakfast was basic and simple but not bad. For example, every morning we had milk with Quaker oats. When they gave us a treat, it was a banana. So we added the banana to the milk and Quaker oats. Lunch and dinner were OK. We didn't have a shower every day. We had hot showers about twice a week. I don't recall any restrictions on how long you could stay in the shower. I can tell you that uh, in the United States Navy, it was two minutes. Uh, I learned to take quick showers uh, in those days. And then you had dress codes and uniforms because that was what was pertinent at the time. And in those days, we had navy blue tunics pleated, said a young student, former student, and a white blouse. My mother used to make them for me. And then by my last year, the school said, forget it, wear dresses. So we wore dresses. But in the 1960s, then styles changed. 
and uh, became more daring. And the girls' school forbid the, wa the wearing of stiff crinoline uh, slips or petticoats. The girls' tunics had to be at least knee length. One teacher reports that the girls were often required to kneel on the ground to see if their skirts touched the ground. And if they didn't, they were sent home. And people had fun. A, uh, a man who's now teaching uh, part-time at Georgetown uh, and uh, also spends time in Ramallah, Salim Tamari, he wrote, uh, he wrote uh, we used to run to the northern part of the school where they had sheds and the outhouses because the toilets were outside. There were a series of taps where people would wash their hands. So this girl, who I liked very much, she and I would go there. We must have been about age seven or eight, and I remember we took our shoes off and we let the water run down on our feet. We started playing with our feet in the water. It was a spring day. Then I grabbed her and kissed her and she hit me. <laughs> she thought it was an unwelcome intrusion, but we remained friends. I remember the kiss. It was the first kiss I ever had. Tamari remembers later, said there were three curriculum streams, art, science, and commerce. It was a new experiment. The girls would come and take science and math classes in the boys' school. Some boys would take art classes in the girls' school, although that was very unusual. So the girls would come, and it was very exhilarating for us. All of a sudden, boys started grooming themselves, taking care of themselves. We were in our teens by then. One common thing we would do was to buy a movie ticket. The movies were reserved seats in those days, so you would buy two reserved seats let's say for Saturday evening. You'd slip the ticket to the girl that you fancied, and then you'd go and wait for the girl to show up. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Mostly they don't, but it was like a gamble because you lose the ticket price. There were several girls I fancied, but I had my greatest crush on one extremely attractive one. I remember buying a number of tickets, and she never showed up although she was friendly to me in class. I mean, we'd have chats, maybe hold hands, but I don't remember having any kisses. And then way back in 1906, one of the very early graduates of the boys' school wrote, and we didn't have this from an oral history, we have this from his memoir. Our lessons consisted chiefly of parables and fables. Very few of us had books, and since most of us were blessed with strong memories, we escaped actually learning anything. I used to be able to recite most of the Gospels by heart, but could not read them. Later, we began to learn not only Arabic, but English, not only reading, but writing, and how to work problems in arithmetic. After writing, we had lessons in poetry. All the boys had to learn a few verses of poetry daily. Then around 1967, in the time of the Nakba, a student observes, we weren't allowed to study our history. Before 1993, possessing a Palestinian flag was illegal. So the word Palestinian was pretty much illegal. We've come a long way, but back then a teacher was very careful about what he or she taught in class if they wanted to go beyond the curriculum. They would be getting in real, real trouble for teaching Palestinian history or the Nakba or occupation. The Israelis, another student writes, closed down the schools in the winter of 1988. Because of the popular uprising, there were lots of neighborhood communities emerging, and it was part of our, and uh, I was part of our neighborhood. We decided we wanted to do a clandestine type of education, which we weren't allowed to do. So we went very secretively about it, but we were teaching in our homes. We would decide where the classes were each day, and I would go as a teacher. I stopped teaching computers 
and we just focused on the basics of English, Arabic, and math because we didn't want the students to miss a whole year of education. Now, I'll give you one guess as to who provided us that oral history. <laughs> Joyce Ajlouni, who was a computer teacher. But the schools, when they closed them down, went local and taught in households all around. And they kept moving them from household to household so you couldn't um, get caught. And it was an odd time. A woman named Ellen Mansour taught Arabic at the girls' school for seven years. And a British officer once asked her incredulously, you teach Arabic to Arabic-speaking people? And she replied, don't you teach English to English-speaking people? <laughs> I guess he'd never thought of that. Another student wrote, we had plays of Shakespeare which were difficult with a classic English language and the meanings behind them and the philosophy behind the plays. It appealed to me. I liked this subject because we were doing classic education. I will just mention as we pass that Betsy and I had the experience uh, in the uh, lower school of uh, watching third graders do uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Third graders did it in English, and they did it beautifully. They did it beautifully. And act by act, they actually changed who was Snow White so that they had different people who were stars of the show. Again, Salim Tamari writes that the Friends School gave me language skills. We had some of the best teachers of Arabic and English in the country. And my language skills became very important for me in my professional development later on. The friends must have given me skills, too, to do my uh, university education because the transition was very smooth. I did well. My writing skills, my, my skills, my language skills were exceptional. My Ramallah friend's school experience gave me skills which I wasn't aware of at the time. I wasn't a good student, but I must have absorbed, and I was a great reader. I used to read day and night. I would read labels. I would read street signs. Wherever you left me in a place, I would start reading. And that must have been something I picked up at school. About English, a student writes, because it is introduced at such an early age in kindergarten, it makes us able to command the language so well. Each subject is taught in both Arabic and English so one year we had math and English. The next year we might have math in the other language. We learned all subjects, sciences and social studies in both languages, and that's how you become bilingual. Really, we can't say that English is our second language because we command the language just as well as Arabic. And then Joyce mentioned the special education or the needs, uh, the education for students with special needs. But they, they can be mild needs, they can be severe, wrote a, a, um, a former principal. And we have them all. We have at least 30 students, now it's 60, in the lower school who have learning difficulties. We all have, also have students with cerebral palsy, autism, other kinds of syndromes and different kinds of disabilities. But the important thing, as she put it, was all students, regardless of physical or cognitive limitations, are mainstreamed into the regular learning environment, but are provided tutors and other special education supports necessary for them to learn. Student placement in the classroom has the added benefit of teaching all students about how everyone can learn. Then there are other things that come up. In the 1967 war, for instance, uh, the Nakba, all young male students wrote or said, one, uh, one person who was interviewed, all young male students between the ages of 16 and 26, wherever they might be, 
once they leave the West Bank, under no condition can they come back into their country and to their homes until after a period of nine months passes as of the date they left the West Bank. As citizens of the West Bank, they're Palestinians who are deprived of one of their basic human rights to come to their homes freely any times they wish. And especially during vacations, if they happen to be students studying outside the West Bank. They have to go through the extra expense of staying in hotels during that period when the school is closed and they have no place to go. They're deprived of certain human rights and of the love and fellowship of their parents, sisters, brothers, and families. And again, a student writes, the schools were closed on and off for the first three years of the Intifada. But in total, I remember that during the three years, we didn't work regularly more than five or six months. They would close it for a semester and then open it for a month or two and then close it again. Most Palestinian students were affected. And then again, many of the neighborhood organiz or neighborhoods organized uh, classes in houses and um, when schools were closed, they went back to, uh, to the regular schools. And finally, a student said, I can't tell you we were traumatized, but you couldn't keep your mind off it. How can you when you're sitting in a classroom and you're listening to the helicopters and you can hear the bombing? So I believe those two years have made me the person that I still am today. I am very happy to have lived through that time because it made us tough. It made us want to pursue bigger dreams, bigger and better prospects. It made us fight for our education even more. It made us closer to our teachers and our friends. Every day you would leave school and not know if you would come back the next day. That's how scary it was. Every day you would be sitting in class not knowing if this was going to be the last day. And maybe we're going to start studying from our houses tomorrow. It was a very spontaneous life. And it's one of the reasons I have never planned ahead ever since. The former principal of the lower school wrote to, or recalled in the history that the occupation affected our children in the education process. They became more distracted, more unfocused, more aggressive. If you go back to 2002, we kept some of the drawings of the children. Their drawings would be all in red. They drew nothing but machinery, tanks, jeeps, and their drawings were scary. It just expressed how they felt, how scared they were. Even their games in school, they would play soldiers. And this is what Joyce was talking about in last year's uh, Gaza uh, invasion and the, uh, the price that students paid. And finally, about the teachers, a student wrote, the teachers were amazing. They treated us as the best. They made us feel like we were the best. They would bring us to their homes to finish our projects on time. They would talk to us to make sure that we were personally okay. They became our personal friends, our counselors. They just embraced us in a way that we needed to be embraced. They made us feel like nothing was unreachable for young children and teenagers caught in the turmoil of school closures, curfews, combat, and protests. The faculty proved to be an extraordinary resource. The friend school said the same person enforces values rather than rules, offering significantly more personal freedom than you would see in other schools. I think that gives room for creativity. It gives room for personal development of the students. And that's why the experience of a friend school student is very student oriented. That's what it's all about. I think it has definitely been one of the things that has shaped my personality, whether from the teachers that I have had the pleasure of interacting with in those years for the students who are also very creative and unique in their own way. I think that because the school has so many resources to take advantage of and there is so much that you can do, it pushes you to find the strength within yourself to start making these things happen. 
these are parts of the oral histories that Betsy collected, the 52 oral histories. They get fleshed out in the book and we talk a little bit to try to give a little detail about them. But uh, the oral histories are really the key things in the book. And uh, some of them are very, very insightful. All of them are inspiring. And I thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Stephanie Reich, and I'm a concerned citizen and re freelance researcher and editor, and I deal with, I'm also a member of Jewish Voice for Peace, very proudly. And uh, I have a question, a logistical question for Joyce about, well, it's, it's a pedagogical question, and that is that if you have a student with, say, a severe learning disability in class, and well obviously or often in that class that student will have a little more difficulty than the others did at, at that day in absorbing the material so would you deal with catching up uh, would you deal with the catching up issues with that student right after the class or at the end of the day or how would you logistically deal with it yeah if it's a student that is known to need more support they normally have an aide with them, helping them right there and then in the classroom. And if that's not enough, then they do a one-on-one -on -one with that student after the class. Because otherwise it might be very difficult for the student to stay afloat. You know, yes, and true. Yeah. yeah. Okay, back there. Thank you for the presentations. I have a question about the curriculum. I was there in the 60s, and the curriculum was all American. And then at one point, the Jordanian government said, you need to introduce the Jordanian curriculum. So at yeah. one point, we had to take both. Yeah. It was a burden, and we complained. But later on, we're all very proud of it. We actually carried both curriculums in the same school year. What's the situation mm -hmm. now, or under the Palestinian Authority in general? Right, well, because we are an international baccalaureate school, the Palestinian Authority's Ministry of Education does give us a bit of a leeway in terms of their curriculum. Uh, so we are strong believers that uh, our students need to, to really master their mother tongue, Arabic. We don't want to become an American international school where our students graduate without a solid knowledge of the Arabic language. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we start off uh, with the Palestinian uh, authorities curriculum which is basically all in Arabic but we do have the English language taught since kindergarten but as the students uh, move from the elementary school to the middle school we start replacing the Arabic language cu curriculum by our own English language curriculum so they start taking in middle school math and English science and English by the time they get to ninth grade they pretty much have everything they study in English in preparation for their diploma program in the IB system. So this is how we ensure bilingualism uh, and a solid you know, um, competency of both languages. And so for the International Baccalaureate, there is a curriculum that we follow. It's an international curriculum that we follow. Sita, do you have a question? Hello, uh, this is really great. Um, I wondered what your uh, connections are with the other uh, schools, uh, especially the, uh, I'm thinking of the uh, St. George's or other um, kind of missionary schools originally, um, international type schools. How are, you, how are you, how do you differ? What kind of relations? Well, we, we, we don't, we differ in our pedagogy uh, pretty much in how we approach education, but I think we have a lot in common with them. We do have a network of uh, private church-based schools that are operating in the Ramallah area. We have uh, monthly meetings. Uh, the principals of the schools meet and coordinate a lot of things. So we have uh, sports leagues with, uh, with the private schools in the, in the Ramallah area and beyond. Even in Amman, our students go and 
play sports with the leagues there. So we are very much connected to the schools uh, in Palestine. But I also want to take this opportunity to say that we have a wonderful relations with Quaker schools in this country. Uh, we have uh, had a long-standing relationship with three schools in Pennsylvania in the Philadelphia area, Westtown, uh, George School, and Penn Charter, and, as, and in Washington, D.C., Sidwell Friends School. These four schools almost annually uh, afford one of our uh, sophomore students a full one-year scholarship. So they come and attend um, uh, school in this country. And, and Westtown and George School also bring students to us, uh, not, not to study, but to on, a, on a visit. They do their senior project uh, for Westtown. They do their student senior project at our school. So every year they come. So we do have a, a nice exchange. We also have a lovely relationship with Quaker colleges like Earlham and Guilford and others who also support our students annually with annual um, scholarship uh, support. So Earlham and Guilford are are our heroes because they, they really give opportunities for students that otherwise uh, would not be uh, available to them. Yes, Bridget. Several years ago, I was at a program at Davis House where the principal, and I don't remember his name, it was a, a man uh, who was the principal of the mala at, of the school at the time. And he said at that time, uh, there were a number of uh, Palestinian Americans who were sending back their children to, to school uh, because they had relatives, like grandmother was living in, Pal in Ramallah, mm -hmm. and so the child stayed with her grandmother or his grandmother yeah. and came to the school. And he said this was actually a good source of income <laughs> for the school uh, to have these. these is, is that still happening? And, and the reason, particularly the girls, he said, was uh, they wanted the, to have more of the culture uh, and that they would not maybe would have lost if they had stayed here for all their high school. Mm. Uh, thanks, Liz. Yes, this is, um, this is a program that was uh, very much uh, part of the, the school program when I was a student there in the, in the 80s and in the late 70s. We had what they, we called the English speaking track and, and, and it catered for these kids who came from uh, the United States. Well, when the first intifada started um, and the schools were closed, uh, these families you know, c were not happy that their children were not getting an education, so they shipped them back to the United States. And so when, when the schools reopened, uh, there was enough demand to fill those seats with Palestinian, local Palestinian students. So uh, in fact, that program ceased from um, continuing uh, however, we do have we do have some students still coming from the United States, especially uh, for high school, because most of the subjects are taught in English at the high school level. We still see some of them coming with the mother or or, or with the grandmother, just for those uh, higher grades. Yes. Hi, um, Joyce. Uh, you have a fairly big facility uh, in a dry land where there's a lot of fighting and destruction. What challenges are posed by the infrastructure? Uh, 20 years ago when I was in Ramallah, it was a very chancy thing to turn on the water tap. So how, how does the infrastructure affect the, the school and, and what choices do you have? Uh, that's a great question. You know, yeah, water shortages, electricity shutdowns are part of, you know, daily lives and especially in the summer for, for water. Uh, I am so proud of our school uh, because it has, uh, during the past few decades, has done so much to, uh, to turn, to, to sort of move towards more uh, environmentally friendly options. The school has the largest water cisterns um, in the area. Uh, at the upper school has, I believe, a total of eight. Uh, we still build new water cisterns. So we collect rainwater that comes in from, from, from the winter rainy season because our summer is so dry. And we use it for 
uh, irrigation, for even toilets, etc., during the, s the school year. And so this is the what we do uh, for for the um, for water shortages. What we are installing next year, and thankfully, thanks to uh, your all your tax dollars and mine, thanks to United States uh, Development Agency USAID. ASHA is the program that supports us, uh, the American schools and hospitals abroad. We now have funding to install photovoltaic cells uh, over our, our, our building. This is going to generate enough electricity to run the entire school, upper school campus, with possibly enough extra to even sell to the electrical company. Mm -hmm. And so that's also a money uh, generator and some one way where we are trying to uh, to, to conserve energy uh, in, in our area where it's very scarce. These are just some examples. Yeah. Yes. I, I've read the book and liked it a lot. I'm a graduate of the French Girls mm -hmm. School and I really appreciate very much uh, what Joyce has done and what you both have done in writing this book. Uh, I haven't been drinking in the morning, but I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, somehow, you know, as long as you have separate schools for the Israelis and for uh, the Palestinians, do you ever envision having Israeli uh, students coming to the school and uh, mixing with Palestinians. Uh, I mean, as of now, as I understand the situation, uh, you have a majority of Palestinians in the land between the river and the, and the sea. So uh, it would be good for the Jewish, uh, not Jewish, but Israeli students to uh, come to the school and uh, get to know the students and get to know their version of history. And uh, um, since the Quakers are very much into peace and uh, reconciliation, do you ever, uh, I mean, as I said, I'm not drinking uh, <laughs> early in the morning. <laughs> do you ever envision such a scenario? Maybe Joyce would be the right well, person. In, in, uh, in an ideal world, um, and as a Quaker myself, uh, obviously uh, dialogue and face-to-face and -face encounters is the only is the only way forward uh, for that reconciliation to take place. But as a school, we ha also have to take into consideration the local context that we're living in. Uh, first of all, we have a wall surrounding us. Uh, we're not allowed to go uh, to their part of the country, and they're not allowed to come to our part of the country. And so physically, first of all, logistically, it's not possible. But also ideologically, we have the community of uh, parents and students who are living under the oppression of occupation, uh, who believe that normalizing relationship with those who are occupying us, who are subjecting us to this injustice, to this horrific way of life, is nothing that we want to take part in. Uh, we have some students who go to the Seeds of Peace camp, for example, here in Maine. Other students are against this. They say this is normalizing relationships with, with the oppressor. And we need to, before we can play soccer together and, and get to know each other, we need to be on equal par. We need to be on an equal footing uh, because these students who are going to play soccer with us are going to be the future soldiers in the Israeli army. Right. So some of them argue, but maybe that's a good thing because this is how you change the mind of the Israeli future Israeli army. Next yeah. time they are stopping you at a checkpoint, uh, they will remember that they played soccer on your field and they will treat you nicer. And some say it's out of it's out of bounds. You're not allowed to, you know, have that relationship. So as a school, w as a Quaker school, we feel we want to support the community. And the community right now 
doesn't want that normalization to take place. They want to resist occupation. And what we help them and what we encourage them to do is to resist, but nonviolently. So we have our students who are supporting the BDS movement, the local boycott. We have students coming to our to us as administration, challenging us on, you know, uh, how well we are boycotting. Uh, the Israeli products, for example, on the school premises, etc. So we support them in that, and as and this is very Quakerly because uh, Quakers have historically been uh, supporting uh, injustices nonviolently and being very creative about it. And so this is how we do it. If I could just use my prerogative up here, I wanted to ask Betsy. Um, whether you collected any uh, oral history interviews from people who might have experienced 1948 uh, at the school. I know they would probably be quite old, but um, what happened in 1948 during the Nakba with the school? Um, well, first off, for those of you who don't know, when Israel was made a state by the UN, uh, very shortly thereafter, we had what we call the Nakba or the catastrophe and some 750 to 800,000 Palestinians were forced to leave their homes and their land. And many of them actually thought that they were coming back in a couple of weeks. So they didn't really prepare for the fact that, no, they were not coming back. And the end result is still there today in that we have like 17 refugee camps of Palestinians in the, the greater Palestinian area and Jordan and whatnot, and you know, these are UN-run institutions, and these people have been there since 1948. I mean, they're still refugees. And I don't know if any of you have read the book The Lemon Tree by Sandy Tolan. It's, it's a very good book. I'd recommend it. He also has a new one called Children's of Stone, which is about the importance of music, again, which sort of kind of came together out of Ramallah Friends School to become a much bigger pro project than in the beginning. But, you know, it's, it's how Ramallah Friends School kind of plants seeds and offers hope and encouragement in different ways. But the particular question about 48 in the school, um, there were refugees into the area, and we talk about this. It was the school as well as the Friends meeting I mean, the Friends Meeting got turned into a mini refugee camp, and they had as many as 400 people, I think, that they were, were housing in mm -hmm. the worship room. Uh, the same was true. One of the stories about um, one of the rooms at the schools that became a birthing room for mothers who were delivering mm -hmm. babies, and the, the highlight was the day that nine babies were born in that one room of the school. And so it was using the supplies and the resources of the school to deal with the refugee issue was very much there. But I don't remember um, any of that in the interview where you were talking to No, I don't actually know that we interviewed somebody specifically about that. We did interview a gentleman who had, had been living in Jaffa and who had, whose family had to leave during the Nakba, and he had ended up it later in high school at Ramallah Friends School. And when I asked him about, are there any family artifacts? And he said, no. He said, we left them all at home. Mm. You know, everything that we had in the way of photographs and of family and mementos and whatnot, just all gone. OK, um, let's see if anybody else has any questions. OK, then we'll let you have the last one, because we have to wrap up. Go ahead. I wondered, going back to the very early days, were there Jewish students uh, at, at, at the school? Uh, yeah, you may know that better than I. I don't really remember. Yes, there, there were. Yeah, there were Jewish students at the school um, early on. In the, at the turn of the century, uh, before the creation of the State of Israel, yeah. When did it I, I can't tell you. I can't tell you exactly, but I know that there were I, I look at the archives and I see some of those names, so very Jewish, yeah. Okay. Well, let me uh, thank our, our three speakers so much again uh, for <laughs> being here with us today.
and again, um, this is a very important, very historic, and, and very profound um, account of the history of the French school in Ramallah. And you can purchase the book in the uh, conference room where you had your sandwiches earlier. So thank you all for coming. <laughs>